We're in store for a great talk right now with two well-established winning authors. They have collaborated on the latest of the Sherlock Holmes Lucy James mystery series, The Return of the Ripper. Anna Elliott and Charles Veeley, who, by the way, are daughter and father. Great, great story behind all that. And uh, we want to thank them for uh, taking part of their Monday evening for uh, stopping by here. So, Charles and uh, Anna, how are you? We're great. We're thank great. You. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Yeah, it's delighted to be here. Uh, fantastic story. My <laughs> wife, let me tell you, my wife is a huge fan of the Sherlock Holmes growing up, uh, oh. the genre. So um, I told her that I'm going to be reading a book, and she says, as soon as you're finished, let me read it. So. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I hope she likes it, too. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sure she will. Um, the Return of the Ripper, this is not the first time you collaborated, though, right? Right. This is, the, like, the fifth. Okay. Yeah. And we've just finished another one. Not not finished to get out the door, but uh, finished the first draft anyhow. So we're chugging away. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so let, let's give some background as far as, as writing and um, Anna. How did you uh, first get interested in writing and, and develop the skills? Um, well, let's see. When I was very small, my dad was actually um, a full-time writer. Uh, he was um, great at it. He was um, writing novels, writing, did some nonfiction, too. And um, so I guess I sort of grew up with that as, you know, a potential career choice in my mind. Like, you know, it wasn't totally outlandish to think, oh, you know, you can never be an author or whatever. Like, it was something my dad did, so mm -hmm. it was a possibility. Um, and then when I was a senior in college, uh, I was in, like, an honors program, and I had to do with an honors thesis to graduate um, with honors in English. And you could do anything. It was a really nice program because it was wide open. You could pick anything that interested you, um, fiction, nonfiction. So my dad kind of really encouraged me to go ahead and write a novel. And I'd really never written fiction up until then, but he really um, encouraged me with like, you know, look, you're a great writer. You've got the, um, you know, the mechanics of writing are down and I really think you can do this. So he bought me a laptop. He um, walked me through sort of the outlining process, gave me all kinds of advice um, for how to do this. And um, so I I did it that year, um, over the course of my senior year, I wrote a, a historical mystery novel, which will never see the light of day because it was, you know, <laughs> right. it's my first novel <laughs> and um, it abides in, you know, the, the library of Penn State with all the other senior honor theses and will forever do so. But it really made me fall in love with um, everything about the writing process. And then I graduated, my husband was... Um, I knew he was going to be in grad school, um, uh, getting his PhD, and I sort of have a one PhD student per marriage philosophy, like one is good. Um, so I didn't really want to go the graduate route anyway. It was not where my passion was. I wanted to be sort of flexible wherever he wound up um, moving to. And um, yeah, so then I, so we got married right after I graduated, and I started, started really pursuing writing as a career seriously. Mm-hmm. No, no, Charlie. You obviously you, you you lent all your expertise to your daughter. How, how did you get started, and and uh, what was it like getting into you know the writing uh, back then? Yo, get, uh, getting into the writing with her. No, no. As far as yourself getting oh, interested oh, in writing. Okay. Yeah. yeah. For for me, it was a whole different deal. This was maybe in the early seventies. And I was at City University of New York, and uh, it had a Ph.D. in English and, you know, scholarship this, scholarship that. But I didn't really like that. <laughs> it's sh shame shameful to admit that I right. didn't really like footnotes that much. And so I, I tried my hand at uh, writing stuff and found an agent who was successful in uh, getting uh, some books published and really had more than I could handle, and so I uh, took the plunge and said, oh, I can do this, uh, I'll be full-time writing, and so we packed up, we moved to Connecticut, uh, quit my quit my tenured position at City University, mm -hmm. and and, uh, uh, and then we moved off 
to off to Connecticut, and uh, Anna was Anna was I think uh, one and a half, two at two years old at the time, and that was great for two, three years, and then there was this uh, big kind of financial downturn at the time, and and the, I had three publishing contracts, three book contracts, and all three editors got let go from their publishing houses, and of course the. It's really tough to keep the project alive when the editor who bought the book is gone. Oh yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> and I, you know, I and to tell the truth, I was having a little more, little more trouble uh, keeping these all these projects going than <clears throat> than I should have, and uh, because you know, had had uh, my son was uh, going into college at the time, and Anna was getting needing to go into nursery school. She was about the right age for that. So, uh, time to get a real job. So, uh, I uh, wound up going to law school and uh, getting, a, getting a real job and moving up into uh, uh, corporate real estate. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and never kind of never looked back in the sense of don't need to be uh, relying on writing as a career. Uh, but, I'm retired now. I have a pension, and it's and uh, I still do work for the for the company uh, consulting. But it's kind of the best of all worlds because I I'm writing with no pressure at all to uh, be financially successful. Right. So that's great. It's that's definitely the way to go. A, a true success story, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the way the uh, John Milton and uh, people like him. Did it? They already had piles of money, so they they wrote for the pure joy of it. Right. Uh, my special guest right now, Anna Elliott, and her father Charles Veeley. They have collaborated uh, on a new book called "The Return of the Ripper" by, and it's uh, Sherlock Holmes, Lucy James mystery. Now, this book it's fascinating. It takes us to uh, the late eighteen hundreds in London, right? Yes, it does. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. how do you, how do you go about choosing the particular time period? And, and you really, it, those that read the book can soak themselves into it and, and get a great feel of it. It's, it's amazing. Uh huh. Oh, thank you. Yeah, but it, okay. you, why did we pick that particular yeah, exactly. time? Yeah, exactly. Right. Well, there's the reason uh, when I I started the the series with the first book, I said it in 1895 because. Uh, Sherlock Holmes fans will uh, maybe know the famous poem of uh, Vincent Starrett, I think is, is his name. It's, uh, it, it's a couplet that says, here, though the world, ex-, at the end of the poem, it's, uh, and he, here, though the world explode, these two survive, and it is always 1895. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, yeah. Holmes and Watson, they're, you know, they're immortal. The, the uh, they call him the man who never lived and who will never die. And I think that's true. There's just something magical about him. So uh, <clears throat> I picked 1895. It's also a good time for if you're writing about Sherlock Holmes because in the uh, official Conan, uh, the stories that Conan Doyle wrote uh, during, uh, during the period, he was not uh, seeking publicity via Watson at all. This was called the Great Hiatus when he had been in, um, uh, supposedly killed in uh, the Reichenbach Falls in the great, uh, the, the, the great uh, controversial uh, end of the story uh, that uh, Conan, when Conan Doyle killed him off. And so chronologically in those, in those years, not much was happening, and in fact, Conan Doyle didn't publish a new Sherlock Holmes book until after 1901, I think it was, that The Hound of the Baskervilles came mm-hmm. out, and even that was set back before, I think, 1889. So you've got a period where you can't, where if you if you say, here's what was happening, uh, nobody is going to say, oh, well, no, go back and look at Sherlock Holmes, and Conan Doyle says he was doing this and that. Oh, okay, so yeah. You, you kind of have an open field for, for that particular uh, uh, period. So we've, we started in 1895, and I think we're, we're now in uh, 1898 or so. Yeah. Uh, 
our, our listeners can uh, go to SherlockandLucy.com. That's where they can order all the books, right? Yeah, you can get them there, or you can do, you can uh, put uh, Sherlock Sherlock Holmes and Lucy James Mysteries into Amazon and get them there. You can put mm-hmm. either of our names into Amazon, and you'll you'll see them that way, or the Return yeah. of the Ripper into Amazon. And, and Thanks, um, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm just going to put in that um, if you go to SherlockandLucy.com, dot com, you can download um, the ebook of the prequel that we wrote together. Um, sort of a prequel to the series. It's a novella, and you can download it completely for free. Mm -hmm. It's called The Crown Jewel Mystery. So if you're, you know, just want to give the series a try, see if it's um, something that, you know, you're interested in, see if it's your cup of tea, no risk related to try it. Um, It's totally free. Yeah. Yeah. You can also get a free uh, audio uh, book version of one of the, of a short story. Mm -hmm. It's a Watson story, but it doesn't have Lucy Lucy in it, but you can get that for free on the website as well. But you can get the uh, you can get the audio book of the free book uh, from Audible, and so you know you can you can have a nice experience for a very low budget. Right. Yes. right. <laughs> and, and you've got and you've got uh, another book in the can. So yes, why, yeah. why you promote this one? Now, now um, let's talk about Lucy James. Um, Anna, giving the voice to Lucy James, a big part of the book, um, how, how did you develop the character? Um, well, luckily for me, my dad was the one who um, invented her first, really, and he um, saw her as this, um, you know, very, sort of a really interesting blend of Sherlock Holmes's intellect, but with much more of sort of passionate nature, I guess, um, a little bit more emotional, a little bit more... Um, intuitive, I guess. Um, so sort of a nice blend of those two and smart as a whip, but um, very brave and very active um, also. And um, yeah, so he had already written two books with her, um, The the Last Moriarty and then The Wilhelm Conspiracy. And of course, I'd read both of those and loved them. And then he said, you know, I really feel like this series would be stronger if... Um, Lucy were a narrator, um, and, you know, if she shared the narration with Watson, then would you be interested in, in taking a crack at her? And I was so thrilled. I was like, yes, absolutely. I would love to, to write her voice. She is such a fun character. She's, um, yeah, she's, I, I really enjoy her very much. And, um, I feel like I can say that cause she's, I mean, she's sort of my creation, but my oh, dad yeah. really yeah. gets the credit for her. Um, and yeah, story. yeah, <laughs> exactly. But, um, right from the start, I mean, as a writer, some, some characters come to you really easily. Some are a little bit tougher nuts to crack and it takes, takes a long time for you to find their voice. But for me, Lucy's voice was just really clear in my head right from the start. I felt like, I don't know, she just had sort of walked on stage and had a lot to say right from the beginning. So, um, yeah, she's been just a complete joy to write from start to finish. Well, you definitely brought a, a strong characters in the book to life. And uh, people can go to SherlockandLucy.com. My special guests right now, Anna Elliott and Charles Veeley, who are uh, daughter and father and uh, have collaborated on the, this book uh, as well. And uh, let me let me talk about the the writing process. I mean, I, I, I assume you you split off the chapters and and what was the way to go back and forth and piece it together and in, in the order of everything. We do, yeah. Um, so I think typically what we do is one of us will kind of have the the sort of the seed of the idea for the book, I guess, mm-hmm. and that that person like is like, oh, this would be a cool mystery for them to be looking into. So for The Return of the Ripper, that was that was my idea. It was like, I, I mean, the time period that we're writing in was only 10 years after the actual Jack the Ripper murders just, you know, completely rocked the world and terrorized London. So I thought, like, you just can't write a mystery series set in London only, to, like, less than 10 years after Jack the Ripper and not have a Jack the Ripper book. It just felt like you, you can't do that. So... I had the idea that wouldn't it be cool if there was this mystery and has Jack the Ripper returned? Is it a copycat? What is it? Um, so 
Yeah, so this one was my initial idea. So I wrote, like, the first part of Lucy's chapters, then handed it off to my dad, and he filled in with Watson's chapters, and then we sort of go back and forth collaborating on what the rest of the book is going to look like. And then for this next one that we're, we just finished the draft of, it was my dad's initial idea. And so he wrote Watson's chapters first for, like, the first, what, half of the book or mm-hmm. third of the book, yeah. and then mm-hmm. sent it to me and said, okay, now you fill in this that Lucy's doing. And then we, then I think we, toward the end, we kind of each, well, one of us will write a chapter send it to the other, and then the, then the other one writes a chapter, so we send it back and forth, kind of tag team, advancing the story that way. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it, it's an interesting process, too, because when you're, at least for me, when, when I'm writing a book, I sort of have an idea about the ending. I mean, I know Sherlock Holmes not going to get killed at the end. It's gonna, he's going to win. <laughs> and, you know, and, you know, we put we put him in these situations where, oh, my God, right, right. <laughs> how is he going to get it? Oh, I don't know. And, we, and you know, I really don't know. And uh, and so uh, I'll, uh, something, and a lot of those, I will, I will get him there, and Anna, <laughs> and then Anna will, Anna is, Anna is, uh, saves the day and then gets him into worse trouble, and then I save the day some more, and goes back yeah. and forth like that, but we think that if we're, if we're surprising ourselves, then the readers are going to be pretty surprised, too, right. and have a fun time with it. Now, yeah. now the uh, Sherlock Holmes genre, a lot of big fans worldwide and everything, um, when, when you put a book out there and, and get critiqued by the fans like that, do, do you keep uh, up on all that stuff? Well, we look at the reviews on Amazon, sort of. We don't, we don't really... We don't, and we've had some. The bloggers have said some nice things. Even Holmes, Holmesish, Holmesians have said right. some nice things. No, but we've had maybe a couple of one stars reviews. And one of them, he didn't like the fact that Sherlock had guns, but he does in the other, in the in the real in the Conan Doyle book. Right, right. He's guns yeah. a couple of several times. So it was like uh, you know. We can't t- pay too much attention to that. Right, right. If there was going to be a huge wave, I think, of a uh, you know, trend of a whole uh, great outcry of, you know, no, it's got to be this or that, and then we'd kind of listen. But now the re- the books all get, you know, average four-plus stars out of five. And, you know, that's, yeah. pretty, that's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. We, like I mean, we are huge fans of the genre, and we're both writing from a place of, really reverence for the Sherlock Holmes canon and for Conan Doyle, and we really try to respect um, the originals and, like, sort of... I mean, we obviously bring our own new stuff to it, but but we're really trying to honor the originals and, and not, um, you know, not do anything that, that disrespects them at all. So I think, like, hopefully other other fans, you know, get that sense, and if they don't, like, I'm sorry, I... I hope that everyone gets that sense, but if they don't, then I I don't feel like we can pay too much attention because we truly are doing our best to honor the um, yeah. the canon. Yeah, right. Yeah. So we, get, we both have great memories of the first time is that we encountered Sherlock Holmes in the in the original stories, mm-hmm. and it's, yeah. there's, there's a kind of there's a kind of reverence there. Also, I think the books are what they call clean reads, just like the Conan Doyle books are. Right, And yeah. I think a lot of people appreciate that. Um, yeah, you so. talk about yeah. subjects, I mean, part of everybody's life, but as you said, clean and nothing to nothing to hide from the kids. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, yeah. I remember reading the, reading the, the, when I first discovered it, I was in like in elementary school or early junior high school, and I would, be, I'd be reading the books walking home, and you know I didn't, you know, hadn't had the birds and the bees talk or any right. any of that, and uh, but I was certainly totally absorbed in that in this book and the books that we're trying to write now uh, for that you know the, for that age group and uh, you know junior high school and up uh, uh, nobody's going we don't want those younger readers to be shocked or bewildered or have an experience that their parents wouldn't want them to have. Right. 
Yeah, if like if you can if you can handle the originals, I feel like you should be able to handle ours. And if you, you know, if I don't I don't want anyone to be too young for our books. If they're you know if, um, when if they're able to handle the originals, that just doesn't feel right to me. Since mm-hmm. we're yeah. Right. Um, yeah, my dad was reading me the Sherlock Holmes Bex's bedtime stories when I was seven and eight, and yeah, I love them. There's there's nothing inappropriate in them. They're you know they deal with other than murder and all that, of course. But right. um, <laughs> but um, yeah, they they were they are fairly clean. They're wholesome, you know. And, um, yeah, I, I, we definitely want the same vibe for our books. Mm-hmm. Now, now, oh, go ahead. Uh, they're a little easier to read. I think the paragraphs, some of the paragraphs are shorter. Mm-hmm. And there tends to be less large uh, blocks of description, so they kind of go a little faster, and maybe the, the plots have a little more uh, you know, kind of big consequential uh, uh, actions about them, like you know, here's Jack the Ripper is coming, coming, but there's also a lot of uh, financial, uh, a lot of money at stake, and a lot, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, political uh, consequences that are going on as well. So, so it's a little different than than like the solitary cyclist or a number of the short stories that Conan Doyle wrote, where it's a single case with a finding out what happened to, you know, a, a, a young a young woman who's uh, fiance is vanished or something like that. It's more consequential than just on a personal level. It has consequences mm-hmm. for a, a lot of people. So they're they're different in that way, but the the voices are still kind of the same, and the as, as Anna said, the overall vibe is still the same. Have have uh, either of you traveled over to to England before? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 In fact, we have a picture yeah. of Anna in front of the Sherlock Holmes Museum in London. Oh, wow. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yep, we have walked past 221B Baker Street, indeed. And, uh, oh, yes. awesome. <laughs> yep. It was a long time ago. I mean, yeah. It was. Yeah, yeah. This wasn't while we were doing the book. Right. If yeah. we went over to now, we'd have a whole lot of different places to visit. That's right. That are yeah. in the book. Yeah, you're yeah. you're living and breathing of what you write uh, and passionate yeah. about it. So the return of the Ripper, Anna Ellie and Charles Veeley, and and it's great, uh, daughter and father collaborating together. Uh, the Sherlock Holmes Lucy James mystery, and uh, Sherlock and Lucy dot com. Let me let me ask you when, when you write a book, is it is it a dream for it to get picked up and maybe a movie made out of it? Yeah, well, I think every every author probably has that dream. Um, very few see it come true, but right. we certainly would not say no if somebody approached us and said, "We got to make a movie out of this." Right. Um, right. Yeah, we 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 love all the Sherlock Holmes adaptations. There's many, many um, movie versions and TV versions, and we have basically watched them all and really enjoyed them all. Um, I think Sherlock Holmes as a character is just amazing on the big screen or on TV or whatever. So yeah, we would love it if that ever happened. Yep. They, they, they know where to find you. Sherlock. That's and Lucy right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All the, yeah. You know, any <laughs> Hollywood producers <laughs> send them our way. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I got to ask you a write, writing process. Um, the modern day technology, how, how, how do you write? Do you, uh, do you work solely on the computer? I do, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, I uh, I used to make a lot of notes by hand, but um, I've got three little kids, and they would, you know, any handwritten notes that I accidentally left around, they would scatter to the four winds, and I would never see them again. <laughs> so I've sort of trained myself to keep everything on one place on my computer where I can see it. Um, yeah, I, I work in Scrivener, um, mm-hmm. which I love. I they don't know me from Adam. I do not get paid for saying this, but Scrivener is a fantastic um, writing program for anyone out there looking to start writing novels. It's an amazing tool for um, organizing your outline and um, just sort of giving you a bird's eye view of your book if you need it and um, keeping track of all your ideas because writing a novel can be very 
a very confusing process if you're trying to, you know, where do I go and what chapter did this happen in and everything. So, um, yeah, I've been using Scrivener for 10 years, I guess, and um, can't imagine writing books without it. Totally don't get paid to say that, but um, if anyone out there is is thinking about writing a novel, I highly recommend it. Right. Big, yeah, that, that's a nice endor- endorsement of that. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, so uh, how, how about you, Charles? I think that's probably why Anne is more efficient than I am. She can. <laughs> she's uh, and I think she's also got way more talent than I do. But uh, No, not true. Yeah, but, well, any, anyhow, um, I use Microsoft Word, mm-hmm. and I'll be writing in Word, and then I'll be you know, going on Google and looking at uh, you know research and websites and this and that. Right. Uh, at the same time, and it, that, as Anna said, it gets very confusing. And if I were better better organized with something like Spooner, I'd probably be able to do things faster. But uh, you know, I kind of get by, and I write do write myself notes on little pads and leave them around, and I'll put them on top of the uh, I'll put them on top of the keyboard uh, if I'm not writing, so that first thing I see will be whatever that note was that uh, I. I Want to do, or here's an idea that I ought to do. So it's kind of a combination, but I'm not nearly as efficient as Anna is. Now, 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 when you get down to the the so-called writer's block, how, how do you get yourself out of being stuck in in something that that's frustrating you? You just write through it. That's the best I, advice I can give. Um, I don't think I've ever been so blocked that I couldn't write. I'm Right, like for me, writing is just life giving. I couldn't love it more. Um, I write every day without fail, a thousand words a day, um, seven days a week. Wow. No matter what, basically, I write when I'm sick. I write through just about anything um, because, however hard a day I'm having, not writing only makes it harder. Writing for me is just couldn't love it more. Um, sounds pretentious to say it's my vocation, but that's it's just. Love it. Um, so, yeah, I, um, I, of course, but it is like any job. I mean, we, I, I, my dad has a, you know, pension and all that. I do not. My husband's a grad student. We're not exactly rolling in the money from his grad student stipend. So, um, I do support my family this way. So it is a job for me. And, um, like any job, there's going to be days when you're like, super excited about it and um you know everything's going great and then there's days when you're like oh I don't know I I don't know what's going to happen in this scene and um I just I sit down and write anyway and um you can't edit a blank page that's you know many people have said that about writing and um just just keep going push through it uh even if you wind up deleting it later even if the scene you write is terrible nobody has to read it and you can you can always fix it let it just be as lousy as it has to be and you can always cut it or you can always make it better but um yeah that's that's all i got for writer's block is you just gotta write through it yeah great great advice there and i would say the same Elliot, yeah. thing the technique that i've got mm-hmm. when i get in the same situation i really don't know what's going to happen but i will pick i will at least i'll say okay Who's in the room? What, what room is it? Uh, what kind of what's going to happen? And maybe I don't know, but at least I'll start. And then I won't look at the screen. I'll only look at the keyboard. I'll keep my eyes totally away, mm-hmm. and I'll, I'll you know start writing words, whatever they are. And then maybe I won't even come back to it until the next day. But I'll get a thousand words, or or two thousand, or five hundred, or however many I do, and. Uh, save it, and then I'll come back and look, and, you know, maybe some of it I can keep, maybe, but at least I will have gotten gotten these characters to do something. They will have done whatever they're going to do, and maybe it's maybe it's silly, maybe it's wrong, uh, maybe I'll throw it out, but at least I've gone from point A beyond, rather than I've got nothing but a blank screen. Yeah. And also... Okay. Uh, the, the other thing is that Anna said that resonated uh, in kind of the same way is if I have written something that day, I feel better. Uh, yeah. If I haven't, if I haven't, then you know, not not that I'm 
not that I'm depressed or anything, because I'm not that kind of a person, but uh, mm-hmm. I, I do feel better if I've got something. Even if it's, even if it's, uh, even if I don't think it's great, it's at least done something. Yeah, just having the words. Yeah. Uh, who, was it Dashiell Hammett who said, when in doubt, send a man through the door with a gun? Is that <laughs> Dashiell Hammett? <laughs> I think that, that has gotten us, actually gotten us out of some, like, some sticky points. Like, there was some chapter that, like, my dad was sent it to me. He wrote it in Watson's voice, and he's like, this is just coming out boring from Watson's voice. Can you try it in Lucy's voice? And so I was trying to adapt what he'd done into Lucy's voice, but it just wasn't working because it was already Watson's voice. And then that popped into my head, like, send a man through the door with a gun. And I, we did, and it actually made it so much better. It worked great. <laughs> totally transformed the scene. It, like, made it fit into the plot really well. Like, it, it really worked. So, yeah. Sometimes you just got to send a man through the door with a gun, I guess. Yep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> that, that's a little behind the scenes from collaborating uh, daughter and father on this great book, The Return of the Ripper, uh, Sherlock Holmes, Lucy James Mystery. And it is out now, and uh, they have one more book that they have uh, just put in the final touches on it, but uh, you must pick this up. And what's the best place that people can get the book? I mean, if they go to SherlockandLucy.com, I can think that's easy to remember. That's the website. They can get a free book there. Okay. They can hear samples of all the audio books, too, as well. And they can click on the books, and the, 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 the links of those books will take them right to the Amazon page, and they can order right there with one click. So that's the easiest way, SherlockandLucy.com, if they, people can remember that, then uh, they can be reading reading in a few moments and we got to thank a few people pam and uh sarah as well for getting the word out for for your great book yay yay we yeah them too. yeah yeah pam is my mom she's been an amazing she's edited the book for us we should give her a shout out that yay. she um oh, okay. she yeah. gives us editorial assistance sometimes and some sounding board assistance and um yeah she's our all-around um peer leader yeah Former yeah. New York editor by my dad. There you, yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yep. So a lot, a lot of talent in the Veely Elliott family, and uh, <laughs> we, I'm sure, lots of more books to follow. So we got to have you on for for the subsequent books that uh, that you're going to release. We'll take. Oh, uh, thank you. We'd be delighted to come anytime. Yeah. Uh, and uh, SherlockandLucy.com will have this interview, uh, if you just tuned in, with Anna Alley and Charles Veeley uh, up on our website, UpperRoomWithJoeKelly.com, later this week. And, and thanks so much, Anna and Charlie. Thank, Thank you so much you. for having us. Yeah, yeah, Appreciate great. It. And, and get the book. Read the book. Lot, lots of uh, a great story in there. So thanks again. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay.